you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Foss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys coming by. Thanks for being a part of the show. As always, we have the most amazing uh, authors on the show, the Pulitzer Prize winners, the billionaires, the CEOs, the White House presidential advisors, you name it. We have the so smartest people on the show. And the reason we do is because none of them are me. I'm the idiot boy with the mic. And that's the only way I got on this show. So uh, that's how you do it. That's why people start podcasting, I think. <laughs> that explains some things. Uh, anyway, guys, we have an amazing uh, multi-book, prolific author. Uh, you're going to be excited to hear from uh, joining us on the show for her new book in her series. Uh, but in the meantime, we have to beg, plead, grovel. You know, we got to pay some bills around here. Please refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Voss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, Chris Voss One on the Tickety Talkity, and Chris Voss Facebook.com. She's the author of the latest book to come out January 9th. 2024. Here we are. Wow. 2024. Uh, it is called The Night Island, part of the Lost Night Files. Jane Ann Krentz joins us on the show today, and she is the author of 50 plus New York Times bestsellers. That's really hard to do, folks. Uh, she writes romantic suspense <clears throat> in three different worlds, contemporary, historical, and futuristic. Uh, and She's uh, got, uh, I'm going to call this 35 million plus copies of her book in print. She told me she lost count a long time ago. And, and yeah, I mean, she just she's pumps out great books and that's it. That's all you need to know. Uh, buy the new one. Uh, Jane, welcome to the show. How are you? I am great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. This is, this is really fun. I, this is, authors don't get out much, you know, so. That's true, and we try to make the show really fun and informative and, and make people laugh, so uh, we're glad to have you as well. Congratulations on the new book, and uh, give us a 30,000 overview of what's in the new... The, the elevator pitch, right? Which there is, you go. <laughs> the thing I'm worst at. Um, but the premise, I can tell you, is that three women walked into a abandoned hotel thinking they were there for a job interview. Mm. And they wake up the next morning in the middle of an earthquake and a fire, and they have no memory of what happened to them during the night. That's Fridays around here. Mm, there you go. But they realize they've got psychic powers they did not have before they went into this hotel. Nobody believes them, of course. Mm -hmm. So they decide to get the answers for themselves. And what do they do? They start a podcast. I mean, <laughs> so what really... else would you do, right? Serious? Wow. All right. There you go. I, I, I started mine without any psychic powers. I'm jealous now. <laughs> but now you have them. See? Do so I? I think, I think the, the beauty of the podcast story is that, in a way, it's our modern version of the amateur sleuth. Yeah. It's the whodunit. I've always loved that story. Yeah. The Hardy Boys and who are the girls? And I think there was the Hardy Boys. There was the amateur sluice when in when I was growing up as a kid, and I think there's a girl's version, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. and there's Miss Marple, and it goes from there. Right. It's yeah. yeah. It's, there you go. It's so uh, the PI story, the private oh. invest. It's it's basically the private investigator story without the license. Ah, there you go. Licenses are expensive anyway. They're rated. Yeah. Um, so this is part two or book two of the uh, series. The Lost Night Files. Tell us what the Lost Night Files series is about. It's a trilogy. Uh, there were three women involved in this incident that happened, and each one is getting their own story. Hmm. And in the end, in the end, out, <laughs> which is what I'm writing now, I'm going to try and pull it all together. This is when all those great ideas you had along the way, you suddenly have to actually make make sense out of. <laughs> <laughs> that describes my life. Um, I'm still working on the making sense part. Um, and so the Lost Night Files, uh, are these the same characters through both books? Well, each heroine kind of takes the front for sta the stage. Um, 
with her romance and her her individual mystery. Each each story has its own in in house mystery, so to speak, or a mystery that's solved within the confines of that of that story. And oh, then wow. there's this overarching story. Um, yeah, I don't do this at home. It's really <laughs> it's it's not the smartest way to make a living. I actually when I realized I was I got the uh, instructions for your show and all the advice to generate lots of good energy. <laughs> I'm thinking, How much coffee did you have before the show, Jane? <laughs> yeah, coffee. I finally, I finally sat down and figured the only thing people ever want to know from authors is how to get published, right? Yeah, yeah. And now you don't even need to know that because anybody can publish a book themselves online. Mm-hmm. However, however, I did come up with a list of, yes, six handy dandy tips to surviving as an author. <laughs> so, so if the show lags, call on me and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a tip or two. All right. Sounds good. We'll, we'll, we'll use you for that. Um, so uh, what, uh, tell us a little bit for those who are not familiar with you, let's lay a foundation. Let's introduce you to them. Tell us about uh, your past growing up. What led you to want to be a writer motivated you getting this into this fear and geez, you, you're, you're all over the place with different genres or, or different, uh, you know, futuristic, past, future. Uh, I think you're multidimensional, I guess, in that sense. Are you, are you working on that too? Um, tell us uh, all about that, how you got down this road. Well, I think I just blundered my way into it, that, that, which is the way most authors kind of get there. Um, basically, I start. I was always a reader, and I think a lot of authors will tell you that, that they, they were heavy library users back in the day. But I think there comes a point at which you want to tell the story, whatever the story is that attracts you, and everybody's got a core story, I think. Um, you want to tell that story your way. And when that happens, that's the <laughs> turn back. <laughs> turn back before it's too late. <laughs> Save yourself. But if, if if the need hits and you're into it, it becomes an addiction, doesn't it? I mean, you just got to yeah. get it down. got to yeah. get it down. That's how I got into cocaine. Uh, so there you go. So you stumbled into it. When did you know you were you were good at it? And it was, you know, because some people try and be writers like me, and they suck at it, but people still buy the books. But um, how did you know that you were good at it? This is your thing. You found your, was, was there any, you know, some people will put out a few books and nothing hits, and they sometimes have to find the right character or formation or the right vehicle. Did you go through any of that? Um, yeah, I think everybody does. It's mm. even, whether you're going through indie publishing or New York publishing, um, it, there's a lot of rejection involved in one in one form or another. And most people, if they can quit, they do. Yeah. Then there's editing. That's a whole new level of rejection. You know, you hand them 50,000 words and they hand back like one page and they go, uh, this is the good part. Well, remember, your job as the writer is to tell the story. Mm hmm. And nothing else can substitute for that. And no, sure. nobody else can substitute for that. Um, so telling the story is my main goal. And when I'm happy with it, I think, I think we write for ourselves first. Is that mm-hmm. how it is for you? I, I mean, I, I don't care about anyone else. I gave up a long time ago. <laughs> worried about it. I'm like, I, that's kind of where I came to at the eve of the publish of my book. I, I sat down, I went, you know what? I don't give a, I'm just not even going to care if anybody likes this book or not. I wrote my story. It's on paper. I don't have to tell the stories anymore. It, you know, people are like, hey, what is the story of your life? I can go, go read the stupid book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I don't have to deal with it anymore. I'm just like, I don't care. It's And the great thing about a book is it's it's there for all eternity or however long Amazon stays in business. It is now. That's for sure. Yeah. No, I think it's I think the power comes from telling the story first for yourself. Yeah. And then you just have to hope like heck that enough people can get into it and and stay with it to buy the books. I mean, that's that there's really nothing you can do to make people like yeah. your stuff. <laughs> and people, well, you can hold a gun to their head too. That works, but uh, don't do that, people. That's just a joke. It's, um, it's a small way to build an audience. A slow way very, to build an audience. Very yeah. slow way to build an audience, and you have to dodge the police too. Um, but uh, no, I mean, like we always say on the show, stories are the owner's manual to life. And whether it's fiction, nonfiction, TV, movies, books, the story is the ways we learn, you know, and we educate ourselves, and we learn to look at things. Maybe we already know them. We, we look at things from different paradigms and different glasses and different 
colors and different mixtures and you know they i mean that's why i do the show and even after thousands of interviews i mean every show i have an epiphany i i'm able to look at things from different um viewpoints and go huh that's interesting and so but you know what i think there's <clears throat> that's an important point it actually happens to be one on my list of six points which is that people ask you where do you get the idea right or how do you do it but don't you think it comes from curiosity we start mm -hmm. just asking questions mm -hmm. and that's how the story starts to come together you start looking for answers and then that's that's how you build a story there you go. You know, I'm working on my second book right now, and I've been really stuck. Um, partially, there's like different ways I want to go, and I'm I'm writing nonfiction, so I actually have to. I it's I, I should just go do fiction because fiction seems like I don't know that it would be easier, but at least I can just make up crap. You know, with nonfiction, I have to actually live in reality and you know facts and crap. But uh, I recently was stuck, and I and so I sat down and. Uh, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to start asking questions of what I would ask the, the executives and business people that I want to talk to about this or that I want to talk about. And so I, I kind of wrote down all these questions and it really helped open up a dam that was blocking me. So you're right. Those you know, questions are really important. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, that's, I'm firmly convinced that's where the, that's where the, uh, that's where the energy comes from. Yeah. And then I haven't written since I wrote the questions out. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, see how, we'll see how that turns out. Um, so uh, tell us about some of your other books and your book series. Are you going to keep staying on the Lost Files line, or are you going to hop around to some other build-outs that you have? Now, the, this is a trilogy, so it's got a beginning and an end, oh. and then I'll be moving on. But I will say that I have a core story, and that core story is basically ro romantic suspense. Mm -hmm. I can't plot without a murder or two. Ah, and my relationships in the stories are always founded on the, the risk of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, so the two things that keep coming up in my work again and again, aside from the basic plot, that, that's a mystery plot, um, are issues of trust and issues of reinvention. My characters are always in the process of having to reinvent themselves for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. life, life has gone downhill fast and they've got to survive. Um, and those two themes are just whatever whatever setting I use, whatever characters I write. Those two themes, I I look back and it's always there. Mm. There you go, trust and murder. You, have you seen a therapist about that? <laughs> I've seen them and they've seen me. Um, so, uh, when do you know what book you're going to go back to? Have you written the third book yet? I'm writing the third book now. There you go. Yeah. So you got it all mapped out in your head. You got no. all laid out. So. <laughs> No, I don't write that way. I wish I did. Um, but you know what? I don't get my best ideas until I'm actually writing. I've tried. Mm -hmm. I've tr tried to outline up front. I've tried my best to do a co complete synopsis. Mm -hmm. Then I start writing the book. Is that is that? Did you find the same thing in nonfiction? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I everyone's like write a synopsis. I'm like, I don't. I'm yeah. just going to barf on the page and figure it all out later. Yeah. That's what I did. What was funny was I had a book accountability group and everyone tried to edit and, you know, make sure all the commas were in the right place as they went. And I just spewed it all. Over the, I just let it all hang out for, um, and that worked. And, and I think that to me, I know I hate people that can do that. I don't know about you, but I look down on them, uh, and <laughs> disgust. I don't, I don't just kidding, but, uh, you know, it, doing it your way where you, you know, there's you you can do you can you can work with the flow and it can build the story. I'm stuck on ergonomic, but it can build the story in the flow of things and 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 you can go. We do the same thing with the show. We don't really have like people will say, Can you sense the questions? Like we don't really work that way. We kind of see, okay, is, what's the what's we try and build the questions out to the flow of the show. And um so I, I don't know, does that sound accurate? Yeah, no, I think yeah. I think different people work different ways. I have author friends who absolutely can outline and stick to that outline right to the very yeah. end. I I think that would be very handy, um, yeah. handy talent to have, yeah. wouldn't it? Because then you don't have to sweat every day when you get up about what you're going to write that day. <laughs> There's a lot of anxiety in my approach. So um, Those guys are just missing all the fun. 
yeah. An adventure. That's what I'm. <laughs> that's how I'm thinking of it. So, so what? What do you find usually inspires you through the day? Maybe if you're a little uh, stuck, or um, you know, you're 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 working on something, but it won't quite push through for you know, in a concept or idea. What do you find helps you get unstuck? I think it's a mistake to think about the whole project. It uh-huh. just, it's overwhelming. Uh-huh. I go from scene to scene and I think of scenes and chapters really, which are, mm-hmm. my chapters are fairly short. Um, maybe one scene or two scenes max. And it, it really it, chapters have come down to scenes for me. And, and for me, that's a short story that mm-hmm. it has a beginning, a middle and an end. And I find that very satisfying to think of it that way because then I'm not thinking about the whole overwhelming story that I have to write. And mm-hmm. I'll just make this part work today. There you go. Eat the elephant one bite at a time, I like to call it. Just <laughs> one bite, yeah. chew it, and you wake up one day and you're the elephant. Uh, you eat the whole elephant. So, <laughs> I that, like that. Yeah. And, and, uh, I'm and, not big on elephant meat, mind you, but sure, I do. Yeah, I yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right now, the vegans are writing me. Uh, the uh, but no, I, I love that analogy. I, any any time whether it's business writing or anything I I do, you know, it, I'll get overwhelmed. I'm I don't know if it's a depression thing or for whatever, but I'll get that overwhelming thing. You're just like, oh my god, this thing, this thing. Uh, and you're just like, just start eating the 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 uh, you know the the giant tree one bite at a time. Wait, vegans are gonna hate me for that too. Damn it, I can't win. <laughs> No, you're you're gonna lose. I just don't go there. Chris. I, don't think, I don't think there's any way to win that one. Um, so what what's your writing process? Uh, we kind of alluded to it a little bit, but do you do you write in the morning? Do you write at night? Uh, do you try and force a certain time period that you write? I'm a morning person, one of those mm-hmm. annoying morning people, and mm-hmm. that's that's my energy for the day. If I don't do it in the morning, it probably won't get done. <laughs> Sadly, I think the afternoons work for things like research or um, maybe putting together some ideas for the next day. But uh, but the creative part is going to be in the morning or not at all. There you go. There are bad days. Yeah. Did you have to do did you have to do uh, any research, go to any islands for research or anything like that? Maybe did you have one? No, I'm serious. Like, did you have one in mind? Uh, well, I live in the, I live in Seattle and the San Juans where this takes place um, oh. are off just out there nearby and mm-hmm. there a lot of them are basically just rocks with trees on them with you know <laughs> nothing on them so they made a perfect location for a leftover um and now closed down government um experimental laboratory mm. and i always i love to plot with the psychic vibe I, I for those out there who are thinking oh she writes paranormal i do but i want to be clear that I don't do the supernatural version. I don't do witches. I don't do ghosts. I don't do um, vampires, but I do like the psychic vibe. Hmm. And I think it's because I think of it as just one step beyond intuition. Mm -hmm. And we've all got some version of intuition and it isn't hard to make the leap to the next level of intuition. Um, And so my characters often, the plot often involves a psychic vibe and, I went to do, you're talking about research. So you go to do the research on this paranormal in America Mm -hmm. and you open up the cupboard, it just comes falling out. It's like, (laughs) there is no telling how much money the government spent chasing paranormal energy, trying to figure out how to harness it, trying to figure out how they could make psychic spies. I mean, it just, it went from the 1930s it, went, it didn't shut down until the 70s, and I wouldn't put money that it hasn't, that it's still going at, in, <laughs> in some clandestine way. It's probably, it, it's probably something to that. Well, the Russians were into it. I mean, it wasn't like it was just a few crazies running around. It was considered serious, a serious yeah, avenue know. of science to pursue. So. You know, it's funny. It's, I wish it was still on my desk. I threw it away to prove it. But last night I went to dinner and there somebody put a little psychic uh, flyer for a psychic on the window of my car. <laughs> and I and I posted on Facebook and I, I wrote the joke. I'm like, shouldn't the psychic use their powers to know that it was wrong marketing to put it on my car because I'm going to toss this? <laughs> like well, that one psychic go. chick who used to have that TV show and she filed bankruptcy. It's like, did she see that coming? <laughs> 
I know the classic joke. What, why didn't you see that coming? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, what got you uh, interested in in psychics and stuff? Was there any anything in your childhood or growing up or yeah, what, what, anything? I, that, uh... In a vague way, um, in a in a gentle way, I guess I would say. My mom was a a hippie before hippies were a thing, right? Oh, okay. Uh, into yoga before anybody else was into yoga. Into meditation, mm -hmm. be yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And she also she always had a profound belief that. Um, we put out energy into the world and there's energy out there and some of it's bad and some of it's good. Mm -hmm. And when I think about it, I can, I can, the logic I can come to is the energy in music, mm -hmm. which doesn't actually touch us, but we all know it has energy. Yeah. Um, Frequencies. Yeah. Yeah. And the energy that um, we feel in other people. I mean, how many times do we say, I don't want to be around them. They just bring me down. Yeah. <laughs> Low yeah. energy, bad energy. They're negative energy. I need positive people. That kind That's of my thing. first ten divorces. And you learn something from this, right? No. Oh, okay. Well. That's why there was ten. <laughs> A slow learner. I like that I joke. Can't, I can't help you set me up perfectly on that one. Thank you. Thank you. That's why there was ten. <laughs> That's what I do. I'm the guest yeah. that sets you up for the joke. <laughs> That's why I get the big bucks. We make a I great come. team. We're going on the road. <laughs> There you go. Um, now, throughout your books, have you always used psychics, or is it just for the series? Not always, but um, mm -hmm. in in the past few years, I've been leaning more and more in that direction. So mm -hmm. it's just. Have you ever gone like... to one? For <laughs> no, I don't actually believe in them. I just like <laughs> it's fiction, Chris. It's fiction. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, you know, you're you're kind of hijacking their industry. Maybe you should, uh, I don't know. Respectfully. I do it respectfully. There you go. There yeah. you go. Uh, but maybe you should just go to one for fun. Maybe you should <laughs> go to one and say, uh, Hey, uh, but you can't guess the plot of my next book. <laughs> and it turns out they got five of my books in the back room and they know exactly what I wild, write. Huh? Crystal ball. I, I can see your covers red. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> you're like, Whoa, holy crap, man. I don't know. Maybe I should start writing about psychics. I, I do think that probably the, the trick with being a good psychic is somebody who can really read, read another person, read the clothes, yeah. read the expression, read the body language. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot with that, even if, without being a psychic. So or can I, I take them on first dates to figure out what kind of mess I'm getting into. Uh, and then they can interpret for me too. Yeah. He's really broken, but I just, I just usually carry a red flag with me on first dates. So that works out well. Um, so any, any of your other series we want to plug that maybe you, 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 uh, do you know what you want to go to once you complete the third book? Uh, well, whatever my contract says. <laughs> wow. And fundamentally, Chris, this is a business. That's um, true. Yeah. I, I, have three names that I currently write under, and that was tip number six uh, <laughs> on my list, which is don't do it. Do not use pen names. This is, I go back, save yourself. This is bad, bad, bad. I wound up with several pen names, and I I use them because now I can use them to, to delineate which worlds I'm writing in, the futuristic mm -hmm. world or the historical world or the contemporary world. Mm -hmm. But in this day and age, you just cannot build three brands like that. You need to you need to consolidate. And for an author, that means don't disrupt the flow with lots of different names. Yeah. I, I I can't tell you how many new authors want to do that. So I can they can write one thing under one name and one thing under another name. Um, but I I my advice is don't go there. There you go. I, I've we had one author on who's really prolific like yourself. Um, and she had written a lot of romance novels under one name and then she got bored with it or something. And she's like, I want to write historical fiction and, uh, you know, but without the sex on the beach, every five pages sort of thing. And, uh, <laughs> romance novels. Uh, and, uh, and so she, she did that and she had to use, she used a different name and I guess eventually her whole fan base figured it out. And now it's a conundrum. So. Yeah, what would it happen if she just stuck with the name? You're going to lose some fans while you pick up a new audience. I think they love her. They just they just figured out that oh, she's over here now. We'll buy her books, and yeah. but now she has to walk around being two people. But you know, that's, for me, that's, that's why. Yeah, the thing the thing that really holds an audience, it pulls an audience, and holds an audience is the voice, uh, and a lot of readers will follow that voice anywhere. 
They just like the storytelling voice. And the nearest way I can explain it is think about audio. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, if you're, if you know people who read audio all the time, they'll tell you the narrator makes or breaks the story. Yeah, it does. It does. And that's how it, and when you're writing, that's your voice and it makes or break your story or your career. You've given me epiphany that, it, that that's why people do that. They love, people love great storytellers and they love the voice that's in the story. I always thought that was kind of, I never gave it much thought. And when I was writing my book, um, I, I had someone who had my voice and knew me very well, who wrote for, uh, who was, did the editing. And I had a few friends that were professional editors and they're like, Hey, we, yeah, we want to edit the book, Chris, you know, we know you were friends on Facebook, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm like, well, here's a page here. Have fun with it and show me what you could do. I guess I don't really understand this whole voice thing. And boy, they wrote it and it sounded like number one, it was in a female voice. Um, it did not sound like any of me and my stories are written in the book. And that's when it really hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, yeah, wow, I, think, I, think of, important. I think of it like, a, I think of it like an accent. You don't really hear uh-huh. it yourself, but everybody mm-hmm. else does. Um, and then when you saw it changed, you recognized it. So that was a, that was actually a good learning experience. Yeah. A lot of authors never make that connection. They just think they're doing it all wrong. There but, you go. It's like when I was, it's like when I was young for the first half of my life, uh, where uh, I didn't know I was stupid, but everybody else knew. So, <laughs> Live and learn. I, I haven't. Um, so there you go. Uh, so what do you hope people <laughs> come away from the book, Gene? Uh, and uh, what do you hope readers come away from with? A good story with a solid romantic relationship and a solid plot. The definition of romantic suspense for mm-hmm. me is that you can't lift out one element and not and have a story left. You can't take out the romance and still have a coherent story. And you can't take out the mystery and have a coherent story. And that's what separates it from mysteries or suspense with a romantic element in the background. Mm-hmm. And you could, you know, you could lift it out and you wouldn't, it wouldn't bar it, you know, mess up the story. Um, and it's what separates romance that has a slight mystery going on in the background where uh-huh. it really is its own genre, romantic suspense. Um, I've been addicted to it since Nancy Drew, and that's what I write. Is that what is that what got you interested in, in the field? Was Nancy Drew? Probably, yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, there you go. Awesome. Romance and murder. Uh, once again, sounds like my first ten marriages. Uh, so there you go. Uh, give us your dot com, Jane. Where can people you find find you on the interwebs? Jane and Krentz at dot com. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much for coming to the show. It's been a lot of fun to have you on and great. And uh, please come back for your future books. We'd love to have you. I would love to. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks, Monis, for tuning in. Order her up her book wherever fine books are sold. The Night Island, The Lost Night Files, book number two. It's so important you read that first one, too. Get, get both of them. Get all of them, damn it. Just order all of her books on Amazon. I think you should be able to press a button for that, can't you? I don't know. That should be good, legal. Good plan. There you go. Came out January 9th, 2024. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, and all those crazy places we're on the internet. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.